Good afternoon, class. Today we're going to cover Unit 12, Chapter 19, Part A, the Cardiovascular System, Blood Vessels. Within the human body, there are 60,000 miles of passageways that carry life-sustaining blood into and out of your heart. These passageways are the body's blood vessels. Blood vessel walls pulsate, constrict, and relax to constantly move blood throughout your body and deliver it to all your body's tissues and organs. The force of blood against the blood vessel wall is known as blood pressure. As a healthcare professional, it is critical that you understand how the body controls blood pressure so that you can accurately measure it in your patients. You can assess the efficiency of your patient's blood circulation through the use of two common measurements, taking your patient's pulse and measuring their blood pressure. The most common method you will use to measure your patient's blood pressure is the osculatory method. This is done through the use of a medical device known as a blood pressure cuff. This device is wrapped around the patient's arm and enables you to listen to or auscultate the sound of blood flow in your patient's brachial artery. The sounds you hear may indicate whether a patient has high blood pressure or hypertension. Hypertension is caused by a number of factors including stress, diet, and obesity. Hypertension is a serious disease that can lead to stroke and even heart failure. Having a solid understanding of how the body controls blood pressure and how and where to measure the blood pressure in your patient is critical to assess their overall circulatory health. On blood vessel structure and function. So blood vessels are the delivery system of dynamic structures that begins and ends at uh, the heart and they work with the lymphatic system to circulate fluids. Uh, there's the arteries that carry blood away from the heart. Uh, it's usually oxygenated uh, except for the pulmonary arteries and the umbilical uh, arteries of the uh, fetus. Uh, capillaries, these have direct contact with tissue cells. They directly serve cellular needs. And veins, they carry blood toward the heart. Uh, and it's generally deoxygenated uh, except for the pulmonary veins and the umbilical vein that carries uh, oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. Figure 19.1, the relationship of blood vessels to each other and to the lymphatic vessels. So the blood uh, will come to the heart, to the right side of the heart via the large veins. Um, and uh, notice there's also large lymphatic vessels that drain into the, uh, those vessels. And then, um, and then the, the right side of the heart is going to pump the uh, deoxygenated blood to the lungs, and then it's going to come back uh, into the left side of the heart, which is going to pump uh, oxygenated blood to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to systemic circulation. Uh, so here we see at the level of the capillaries, that's, they're called exchange vessels because that's where exchange of nutrients uh, oxygen, CO2 uh, happens. Uh, large veins are called capacitance vessels uh, and uh, the uh, our arteries are called, there's uh, two types, the elastic arteries and muscular arteries. So we're, uh, we're going to talk about these different types. Um, so uh, section 19.1, structure of blood vessel wall. So all vessels consist of a lumen, which is the central blood containing space surrounded by a wall. The walls of all vessels, except the capillaries, have three layers or tunics. The tunica intima, the tunica media, and the outside one is called the tunica externa. And uh, capillaries, uh, the endothelium, are made up of an endothelium with sparse basal lamina. Very, uh, um, uh, very uh, uh, small vessels uh, that uh, are very thin, thin small vessels. So let's look at the tunica intima. It's the innermost layer that is in intimate contact with the blood. The endothelium, this is uh, made up of simple squamous epithelium that lines the lumen of all vessels and it is continuous with the endocardium. Uh, it's a slick, it has got a slick surface that reduces friction. Uh, the subendothelial layer is a connective tissue basement membrane as, and it's only found in vessels larger than one millimeter. The tunica media is the middle layer composed mostly of smooth muscle and sheets of elastin. Uh, 
the sympathetic vasomotor nerve fibers innervate this layer and they control vasoconstriction, which uh, the result of that is decreasing the lumen diameter, whereas vasodilation is going to increase the lumen diameter. Uh, this is the bulkiest layer and is responsible for maintaining blood flow and blood pressure. The tunica externa is the outermost layer of cells. It's also called the tunica adventitia. It's composed mostly of loose collagen fibers that protect and reinforce the wall and anchor it to the surrounding structures. It's infiltrated with nerve fibers, lymphatic vessels. Large veins also contain elastic fibers in this layer. Vasa vasorum is a system of tiny blood vessels found in the larger vessels, and the function is to nourish the outermost external layer. Figure 19.2b shows uh, a cross-section of the artery, the vein, and a capillary. Uh, notice that they, uh, the arteries and veins have the three uh, tunics, the tunica in intima, uh, that's the innermost one, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. Um, and the vasa vasorum uh, for large arteries and veins. Uh, and then at the level of the capillaries, it's basically endothelial cells surrounded by a basement uh, membrane. Uh, so the tunica intima has that endothelial layer, subendothelial layer, and internal elastic membrane. The tunica media is made up of smooth muscle and elastic fibers uh, and this, uh, with this external elastic membrane. The tunica externa is, consists of collagen fibers, and then we see the vasa vasorum. Table 19.1, one summary of blood vessel anatomy. So here we have uh, three types of arteries. Uh, there's the uh, elastic artery, the muscular artery, and the arterial. Uh, so, um, and it gives the uh, average lumen diameter and wall thickness. Uh, and then uh, relative tissue makeup, so they vary, uh, but they all have that smooth muscle, uh, layer of smooth muscles. Uh, this is part two. Uh, this shows, this figure shows uh, capillaries, vein, uh, venules, and veins, and again, uh, the average lumen diameter and wall thickness and the relative tissue uh, makeup. So arteries, uh, section 19.2 arteries are divided into three groups based on size and function, elastic arteries, muscular arteries, and arterioles. Elastic arteries are thick walled with large low resistance lumen. The, it's basically the aorta and its major branches. They're also called conducting arteries because they conduct blood from the heart to medium sized vessels. Uh, elastin is found in all three tunics, mostly tunica media. Uh, they contain substantial smooth muscle, but inactive in vasoconstriction. Uh, elastic arteries act as pressure reservoirs that expand and recoil as blood is ejected from the heart. Uh, and this allows for a continuous blood flow downstream, even between heartbeats. Muscular arteries. Um, so these, the elastic arteries give rise to muscular arteries. Uh, they're also called distributing arteries because they deliver uh, blood to the body organs. The diameters range from pinky finger size to pencil lead size. Uh, they account for most of named arteries. Uh, they have the thickest tunica media with more smooth muscle but less elastic tissue. Uh, the tunica media is sang sandwiched between elastic membranes and they're active in vasoconstriction. Arterioles are the smallest of all arteries. Uh, larger arterioles contain all three tunics. The smaller ones are mostly sing a single layer of smooth muscle surrounding the endothelial cells. Uh, they control the flow into the capillary beds via vasodilation and vasoconstriction of their smooth muscle. They're also called resistance arteries because changing diameters change the resistance to blood flow. Uh, and so they lead to the capillary beds. Section 19.3, capillaries. Uh, these are microscopic vessels. The diameters are so small uh, that only a single red blood cell can pass through at a time. Uh, the walls are just consist of this thin tunica intima. In the smallest vessels, one cell forms the entire circumference. 
Uh, pericytes are spi spider-shaped stem cells that help stabilize the capillary walls, control permeability, and play a role in vessel repair. Uh, they supply almost every cell except for cartilage, epithelia, cornea, and the lens of the eye. Major functions of capillaries are exchange of gases, nutrients, wastes, hormones between blood and interstitial fluid. Types of capillaries, so all capillary endothelial cells are joined by tight junctions with gaps called intercellular clefts that allow passage of fluids and small solutes. There are three types of capillaries. Continuous capillaries, these are abundant in the skin, muscles, lungs, and central nervous system. And so the continuous capillaries of the brain are unique because they form the blood-brain barrier, barrier uh, which is a totally, a totally enclosed with tight junctions and no intercellular clefts. Figure 19.3a shows uh, a, a continuous um, capillary. So these, we said, uh, continuous capillaries are the least permeable and the most common. Uh, they're found in the skin, muscles, lungs, and central nervous system, often have associated pericytes, uh, as you can see in the figure. Uh, penocytotic vesicles ferry fluid across the endothelial cell. Uh, most continuous capillaries have intercellular clefts between endothelial cells. However, the brain capillary endothelial cells do not have the intercellular clefts and have tight junctions around their entire perimeter. And this accounts for the blood-brain barrier uh, that we are going to discuss in chapter 12. Another type of capillary is called fenestrated capillary. They're found in areas involved in active filtration. The kidneys have them, absorption, so in the intestines, or endocrine hormone secretion. Uh, endothelial cells contain the Swiss-like, uh, Swiss cheese-like pores called fenestrations. Fenestrations are like little windows, fenêtre in French. Uh, they allow for increased permeability, and the fenestrations usually covered with a thin glycoprotein diaphragm. 19.3b uh, shows this type of capillary, the fenestrated. Uh, so they have large pores, as you can see from the figure, that increase permeability. Uh, so they occur in areas of active filtration, like the kidneys, absorption, like small intestine, and areas of endocrine hormone secretion. Uh, fenestrations are these little holes that tunnel through endothelial cells. Uh, fenestrations are usually covered by a very thin layer of condensed extracellular glycoproteins. This layer has little effect on solute and flow, fluid movement. In some digestive tract organs, the number of fenestrations in the capillaries increases during active absorption of nutrients. Third type is called sinusoidal capillaries. They have fewer tight junctions, usually fenestrated with larger intercellular clefts and incomplete basement membranes usually have larger lumens. They're found only in the liver, bone marrow, spleen, and adrenal medulla. Uh, that's the innermost portion of the adrenal gland. The blood flow here is sluggish, and it allows time for modification of large molecules and blood cells that pass between blood and tissue. They also contain macrophages uh, in the lining to capture and destroy foreign invaders. Figure 19.3c shows a sinusoid capillary. Uh, so they're the most permeable and occur in very limited locations, such as in the liver, bone marrow, spleen, and adrenal medulla. They have large intercellular clefts as well as fenestrations with few tight junctions. Incomplete basement membranes uh, are irregularly shaped and have larger lumens than other capillaries and they allow large molecules and even cells to pass across their walls. The blood flows slowly uh, and they also contain macrophages uh, that, um, uh, that extend through the clefts to catch prey or in the liver form part of these sinusoid wall. Capillary beds. So a capillary bed is an interwoven network of capillaries between arterioles and venules. Uh, microcirculation is the flow of blood through the bed from the arteriole to the venule. Terminal arteriole is the branch of the arteriole that further branches into 10 to 20 capillaries, uh, the exchange vessels that form the capillary bed. 
Uh, so what happens here, we said, exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste from the surrounding tissue uh, at the level of the capillaries. And then capillaries drain into a post-capillary venule. Flow through the bed is controlled by the diameter of the terminal arterial and upstream arterioles. Local chemical conditions and arteriolar vasomotor nerve fibers regulate the amount of blood that enters the capillary bed. Arterial and terminal arterial dilated when the blood is needed and it's constricted to shunt blood away from the capillary when it's not needed. Figure 19.4 shows um, in A, when you have the arterioles dilated, uh, so that means that increases the diameter, uh, the lumen diameter, and so blood flows through the capillaries, whereas if the arterioles constrict uh, and reducing the uh, lumen, uh, then there's no blood flow uh, through the capillaries. Uh, capillaries found in serous membranes of intestinal mesenteries have two additional features that form a special arrangement of capillaries. The first one is the vascular shunt. It's a channel that directly connects the arterial with the venule and so bypasses the true capillaries. And it consists of a meta-arterial and a thoroughfare channel. And the second one, uh, second arrangement is the pre-capillary sphincter, which is a cuff of smooth muscle surrounding each true capillary that branches off the meta-arterial. And it acts as a valve regulating blood flow into the capillary bed. And this is controlled by local chemical, chemical conditions, so it's not direct, it's not innervated. Figure 19.5 shows these special arrangements uh, in the capillary bed. So notice the vascular shunt uh, that bypasses the capillary bed from the meta-arterial to the th uh, thoroughfare channel. And the other one is the presence of pre-capillary sphincters that will close, uh, let's say they're closed. And so then we have this uh, blood flowing directly from the arterial to the venule. Section 19.4, veins. So very, veins carry blood toward the heart. Uh, formation begins when capillary beds unite in post-capillary venules and merge into larger and larger veins. Uh, venules are, um, uh, so then there's venules and capillaries unite to form post-capillary venules uh, that consist of endothelium and a few pericytes these are very porous and allow fluids and white blood cells into tissues. Uh, larger venules have one or two layers of smooth muscle cells. Veins are formed when venules converge. They have all tunics but thinner walls with large lumens compared with the corresponding arteries. The tunica media is thin but the tunica externa is thick. Uh, and it contains collagen fibers and elastic networks. The large lumen and thin walls make veins good storage vessels, and they are called uh, capacitance vessels or blood reservoirs because they contain up to 65% of the blood supply. Here is uh, figure 19.2a, a cross-section of the artery and the vein. We've already seen this in the uh, lab. Notice the uh, thicker uh, tunica media in the artery and also notice uh, the veins are more collapsed. Figure 19.6, relative proportion of blood volume throughout the cardiovascular system. So systemic veins and venules will contain about 60% uh, of the uh, blood supply. So uh, systemic veins supply all of the body except the lungs, are distensible and contain a large proportion of the blood volume, and so they are called capacitance vessels or blood reservoirs. Uh, then we have the systemic arteries that contain about, uh, and arterioles, about 15%, pulmonary blood vessels, 12%. So these are the pulmonary blood vessels that supply the lungs. Then the heart itself, has about 8% and capillaries 5%. The blood pressure is lower in the veins than in the arteries, so adaptations ensure the return of blood to the heart. So large diameter lumens offer less little resistance, as opposed to if the lumen would have been uh, smaller. Uh, other adaptations are venous valves that prevent the backflow of blood 
uh, and they're especially abundant in the veins of the limbs, uh, so that uh, blood does not pool in the uh, lower extremities. Uh, venous sinuses is another adaptation. Uh, so these are flattened veins with extremely thin walls composed only of endothelium. Examples of, are the coronary sinus of the heart and the dural sinuses located in the brain. Homeostatic imbalance 19.1. Varicose veins, these are dilated and painful veins due to incompetent or leaky valves. Factors that contribute include heredity, some people are more gen genetically prone to having varicose veins, and conditions that hinder venous return, like prolonged standing in one position, obesity or pregnancy, uh, blood pools in the lower limbs, weakening valves. Uh, it affects more than 15% of adults. An elevated venous pressure can cause varicose veins. Example, straining to deliver a baby or have a bowel movement raises the intra-abdominal pressure, resulting in varicosities in the anal veins called hemorrhoids. 18.5 anastomoses. Vascular anastomoses, these are interconnections of blood vessels. Arterial anastomoses provide alternate pathways collateral channels to ensure continuous flow even if one artery is blocked. It's very common in joints, abdominal organs, the brain, and heart. Uh, there's none in the retina, kidneys, or spleen. Arteriovenous anastomoses, these are shunts in the capillaries. Uh, an example is the metarterial thoroughfare channel that we talked about. And a venous anastomoses are so abundant that occluded veins rarely block blood flow. Part two, physiology of circulation. So the goal of cardiovascular regulation is the maintenance of adequate blood flow through the peripheral tissues and organs. Under normal circumstances, the blood flow is equal to the cardiac output. So when the cardiac output goes up, so does the blood flow through the capillary beds. And conversely, when cardiac output declines, capillary blood flow is reduced. Section 19.6, flow, pressure, and resistance. Let's define a few terms. Blood flow is the volume of blood flowing through a vessel, organ, or entire circulation in a given period. It's measured in milliliters per minute, and it is equivalent to the cardiac output for the entire vascular system. Overall, it is relatively constant when at rest, but at any given moment, it varies at individual organ level, and it's based on needs. The blood pressure is the force per unit area exerted on the wall of a blood vessel by the blood, and it's expressed in millimeters of mercury. It's measured as systemic arterial blood pressure in large arteries near the heart, uh, and the pressure gradient provides this, the driving force that keeps the blood moving from higher to lower pressure areas. Another term is resistance, and we really refer to as uh, peripheral resistance because that's where the resistance is, uh, that's where it, it's really coming from um, because the uh, arteries are much, uh, have smaller diameter than the large arteries of the uh, aorta, um, for example, uh, and the dorsal uh, aorta. Uh, so resistance is opposition to flow. It's a measurement of the amount of friction the blood encounters with, with vessel walls, and it's generally in peripheral or systemic circulation. There are three important sources of resistance, the blood viscosity, total blood vessel length, and blood vessel diameter. Blood viscosity is the thickness or stickiness of blood due to deformed elements and plasma proteins. The greater the viscosity, the less easily molecules are able to slide past each other. Increased viscosity equals increased resistance. Uh, if we look at the total blood vessel length, the longer the vessel, the greater the resistance encountered. The third factor, blood vessel diameter, this has the greatest influence on resistance. Uh, frequent changes will alter peripheral resistance. Viscosity and blood vessel length are relatively constant. 
uh, fluid close to the walls moves more slowly than in the middle of the tube, and this is called laminar flow. Resistance varies inversely with the fourth power of vessel radius. So if the radius increases, the resistance decreases and vice versa. So if, for example, if the radius is doubled, then the resistance drops to 1 16th as much. Small diameter arterioles are the major determinants of peripheral resistance because the radius changes frequently in contrast to the larger arteries that do not change often. Abrupt changes in vessel diameter or obstacles such as fatty plaques from atherosclerosis will dramatically increase the resistance. Laminar flow is disrupted and becomes turbulent flow, which is irregular flow that causes increased resistance. This concept can be demonstrated uh, with a milkshake and two different straws of different diameter and length. So obviously the first straw will, would allow us to drink more milkshake, uh, the, so the flow rate would be higher than with the, uh, the one on the right uh, because it's longer and also has a smaller diameter. Relationship between flow, pressure, and resistance. So blood flow is directly proportional proportional to blood pressure gradient. So if the delta P increases, the blood flow it speeds up as well. Uh, the blood flow is inversely proportional to peripheral resistance. So if the resistance increases, the blood flow is going to decrease. So R resistance is more important in influencing local blood flow because it is easily changed by altering the blood vessel diameter. Systemic blood pressure. The pumping action of the heart generates blood flow. Pressure results when the flow is opposed by resistance. Systemic pressure is highest in the aorta and declines throughout the pathway. It's the steepest drop occurs in arterioles because of the decreasing diameter. This concept is illustrated in figure 19.7 that shows the blood pressure in various blood vessels of the systemic circulation. So very, uh, the blood uh, pressure is really high in the aorta and there's a, um, there's a drop uh, by the time it reaches the, uh, the vena cavae. Uh, arterial blood pressure is determined by two factors. The first one is the elasticity or compliance or distensibility of the arteries that are close to the heart. And the second is the volume of blood forced into them at any time. Uh, the blood pressure near the heart is pulsatile, which rises and falls with each heartbeat. The systolic pressure is a pressure exerted in the aorta during ventricular contraction. Uh, the left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta, imparting kinetic energy that stretches the aorta, and it averages at 120 millimeters of mercury in the adult a normal adult. Diastolic pressure is the lowest level of aortic pressure when the heart is at rest and it's around uh, 80 millimeters of mercury. The pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure, whereas the pulse is the throbbing of arteries due to difference in pulse pressures which can be felt under the skin. The mean arterial pressure abbreviated as MAP, is a pressure that propels blood to the tissues. The pulse pressure phases out near the end of the arterial tree, and the flow is non-pulsatile with a steady mean arterial pressure. Um, the heart spends more time in diastole, so not just a simple average of diastole and systole. The mean arterial pressure is calculated by adding the diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. So for example, for a given blood pressure of 120 over 80, the pulse pressure is 120 minus 80, which is 40. So the mean arterial pressure is 80 plus a third of 40, which, which is 80 plus approximately 13, which is 93 millimeters of mercury. So pulse pressure and mean arterial pressure both decline with increasing distance from the heart. Clinical monitoring of circulatory efficiency. So vital signs is basically when you're taking somebody's vital signs, you're looking at the pulse and blood pressure along with the respiratory rate and body temperature. So taking a pulse, uh, there's a radial pulse which is taken at the wrist, most routinely used, but there are other clinically important pulse points. 
Uh, pressure points are areas where the arteries are close to the body surface. These can be compressed to stop blood flow in the event of hemorrhaging. Figure 19.8 are body sites where the pulse is most easily palpated. Uh, systemic arterial blood pressure is measured indirectly by auscultatory methods using a sphygmomanometer, where you wrap the cuff around the arm superior to the elbow, increase the pressure in the cuff until it ex exceeds the systolic pressure in the brachial artery, and the pressure is released slowly, and the examiner listens for the sounds of cord cough with a stethoscope. The systolic pressure normally less than 120 millimeters of mercury. The pressure when sounds first occur as blood starts to spurt through the artery. Whereas the diastolic pressure is normally less than 80 millimeters of mercury. is a pressure when the sounds disappear because the artery no longer uh, is constricted and then the blood flow flows freely. Capillary blood pressure ranges from 35 millimeters of mercury at the beginning of capillary bed to approximately 17 millimeters of mercury at the end of the bed. Low capillary pressure is desirable because a high blood pressure would rupture the fragile thin-walled capillaries and most capillaries are very permeable so low pressure forces the filtrate into the interstitial spaces. This blood pressure changes little during cardiac pre uh, cycle. Uh, this, it's a small pressure gradient, only about 15 millimeters of mercury. If the vein is cut, the low pressure of the venous system causes the blood to flow out smoothly. If an artery is cut, the blood spurts out because the pressure is higher. Low pressure is due to accumulative effects of peripheral resistance. The energy of blood pressure is lost as heat during each circuit. Low pressure of the venous side requires adaptations to help with venous return, which we've already discussed. Factors aiding uh, venous return are a muscular pump, so the contraction of skeletal muscles milks blood back toward the heart against gravity, and valves also prevent backflow. These we've talked about. Respiratory pump is the pressure changes during breathing that moves the blood towards the heart by squeezing the abdominal veins as the thoracic veins expand. And thirdly is a sympathetic venoconstriction. So under the sympathetic control, smooth muscles constrict, pushing blood back toward the heart. This is the muscular pump, uh, figure 19.9, uh, where you have the contraction of the skeletal muscle uh, that ensures the uh, movement of blood uh, toward, uh, up, uh, and also in conjunction with the uh, venous valve. Section 19.8, regulation of blood pressure. So maintaining blood pressure requires the cooperation of the heart, the blood vessels, and the kidneys, and it's all supervised by the brain. There are three main factors regulating blood pressure, cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and blood volume. Blood pressure varies directly with cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and blood volume. So uh, just a reminder, the uh, F is the blood flow is the delta P, delta pressure over the, uh, the change in pressure over the uh, resistance. So that F is uh, cardiac output. So substituting it gives cardiac output is uh, delta P over R and rearranging delta P is cardiac output multiplied by the resistance. This shows that blood pressure is directly proportional to cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Changes in one variable are quickly compensated for by changes in the other variables. So if you recall, cardiac output is equal to the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. So if the mean arterial pressure is CO multiplied by the resistance, then the MAP is SV multiplied by HR multiplied by R. So that anything that increases the stroke volume, the heart rate, or the resistance will also increase the mean arterial pressure. The stroke volume is affected by the venous return, or EDV, and, and diastolic volume. The heart rate is maintained by the medullary centers, and the resistance is affected mostly by vessel diameter. Factors can be regulated by short-term regulation, 
through neural controls, short-term regulation through hormonal controls, and long-term regulation through renal controls. Major factors that increase the mean arterial pressure. So this is figure 1910 that is going to, that is um, summarizing. So if you increase the stroke volume and you increase the heart rate, that's going to increase the cardiac output, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. If you decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, and you increase the blood viscosity and you increase the blood vessel length, you're going to increase the total peripheral resistance, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. Short-term regulation. Let's start looking at neural controls. So two main neural mechanisms control peripheral resistance. The first one is the mean arterial pressure that is maintained by altering the blood vessel diameter, which alters resistance. So for example, if the blood volume drops, all vessels constrict except those to the heart and brain. Second, it can alter the blood distribution to organs in response to specific demands. Okay, so the neural controls will do that. Uh, so certain organs will need uh, more blood depending on the uh, on what activity is uh, is going on. So for example, exercise is going to need uh, during exercise you would have more blood flow to the uh, skeletal muscles, for example. Neural controls operate via reflex arcs that involve cardiovascular center of the medulla of the brain, baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and higher brain centers. Role of the cardiovascular center. So the cardiovascular center is composed of clusters of sympathetic neurons in the medulla oblongata. It consists of cardiac centers, which are cardio-inhibitory and cardio-accelatory centers, which we've already discussed, vasomotor center, is uh, sends a steady, Im steady impulses via the sympathetic efferents called vasomotor fibers to the blood vessels, which cause a continuous moderate constriction called vasomotor tone. Also, uh, the role of the cardiovascular, cent cardiovascular centers to receive inputs from baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and higher brain centers. So baroreceptor reflexes. These are located in the carotid sinuses, aortic arch, and the walls of the large arteries of the neck and thorax. If the mean arterial pressure is high, the increased blood pressure stimulates the baroreceptors to increase input to the vasomotor center. And this is going to inhibit the vasomotor and cardioaccelatory centers, but stimulate the cardioinhibitory center, and the result is a decreased blood pressure. The resulting decrease in blood pressure is due to two mechanisms. The first one is vasodilation, which is a decreased output from vasomotor center, which causes dilation. Arterial, arterial, arteriolar vasodilation reduces peripheral resistance and the mean arterial pressure is going to fall. Venodilation shifts blood to venous reservoirs, decreasing the venous return and the cardiac output. The second mechanism is a decreased cardiac output. So impulses to the cardiac centers will inhibit sympathetic activity and stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And the result of that is a reduction in the heart rate and the contractility. The cardiac output decreases, uh, decrease, the cardiac output decrease will cause a decrease in the mean arterial. If the mean arterial pressure is low, reflex vasoconstriction is initiated that increases the cardiac output and blood pressure. So for example, upon standing, the blood pressure falls and triggers the carotid sinus reflex, where baroreceptors that monitor the blood pressure uh, ensure enough blood to the brain, and the aortic reflex, which maintains the blood pressure in the systemic circuit. Baroreceptors are ineffective if altered blood pressure is sustained, uh, they become adapted to hypertension, so not trigger, so it's not triggered by elevated blood pressure levels.
1911 baroreceptor reflexes that help maintain blood pressure hemostasis. Okay, so here we are looking at blood pressure in a normal range. So if we look at one, the stimulus is an increase in blood pressure. So arterial blood pressure rises above a normal range. So that creates an imbalance that is sensed by the baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch. So these are stimulated and these impulse will send impulses fr to, uh, from the baroreceptors to the cardioinhibitory center and inhibit the cardioaccelatory center and inhibit vasomotor center. These will send uh, a response through, uh, so a decreased sympathetic impulses to the heart, which will decrease the heart rate, decrease contractility, and decrease the cardiac output. And also will decrease the rate of vasomotor impulses, which allows vasodilation, causing a decrease in the TPR. Five, decreased cardiac output and decreased TPR are going to return the blood pressure to a homeostatic range. Conversely, if the stimulus is a decrease in blood pressure, where the arterial blood pressure falls below a normal range, this is going to be uh, a stimulus for the baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch, where we have inhibition, and so uh, it's going to send less or decreased impulses from the baroreceptors, and this is going to activate the cardioaccelatory center and inhibit the cardioinhibitory center and stimulate the vasomotor center in the brain, which is going to increase sympathetic impulses to the heart, which is going to cause an increased heart rate, increased contractility, and hence increase in cardiac output, and also is going to uh, the vasomotor fibers are going to stimulate vasoconstriction, which causes an increase in the TPR, which is going to increase the cardiac output and increase in the TPR, which is going to return the blood pressure to the homeostatic range. Uh, chemoreceptor reflexes, uh, these are another example of neural controls. So the aortic arch and large arteries of the neck detect an increase in the carbon in CO2 or drop in pH or O2 and these will cause an increased blood pressure by signaling the cardioaccelatory uh, center to increase the cardiac output and is also going to signal the vasomotor center to increase vasoconstriction. In terms of the influence of higher brain centers, so reflexes that regulate the blood pressure are found in the medulla. But the hypothalamus and cerebral cortex can modify the arterial pressure via relays to the medulla. The hypothalamus increases blood pressure during stress, and the hypothalamus mediates redistribution of blood flow during exercise and changes in body temperature. Now let's look at the short-term mechanisms, this one, hormonal control. So hormones regulate blood pressure in short-term via changes in peripheral resistance or long-term via changes in blood pressure. So the adrenal medulla produces two hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal gland that increase the cardiac output and vasoconstriction. Uh, another hormone is angiotensin II, and this hormone also stimulates vasoconstriction. Another hormone is called ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Uh, high levels of it can cause vasoconstriction. And there's another hormone that is, um, uh, that is uh, actually secreted by the heart, the walls of the heart, is just called ANP or atrial natriuretic peptide, which will decrease the blood pressure by antagonizing aldosterone, causing a decreased blood volume. So this table is going to sh uh, shows the effects of selected hormones on blood pressure. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, these are produced by the, uh, the, uh, the adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla, and they will um, increase the blood pressure. Angiotensin II also increases the blood pressure. ADH increases the blood pressure, aldosterone as well. Um, and um, the ANP is going to decrease the, the uh, blood pressure. 
Now let's look at long-term mechanisms, renal regulation. So we're looking at the level of the kidneys. Bioreceptors quickly adapt to a chronic high or low blood pressure, so are ineffective for long-term regulation. Long-term mechanisms control blood pressure by altering the blood volume via the kidneys. Kidneys regulate arterial blood pressure by direct renal mechanisms and an indirect renal mechanism known as the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone. Let's start with the direct renal mechanism. This mechanism alters the blood volume independently of hormones. An increased blood pressure or blood volume causes elimination of more urine, thus reducing the blood pressure. A decreased blood pressure or blood volume will cause the kidneys to conserve or retain more water, and that is going to have the effect of increasing the blood pressure. Figure 19.12, direct, let's look at on the left, the direct renal mechanism. So let's say there's a decrease in arterial pressure. This is going to affect filtration by the kidneys. There's going to be a decrease at the level of the uh, nephron of the kidneys. And that is going to, because there's less blood that is going to be filtered, there's going to be less urine that is going to be formed. And that is going to, all that water, uh, is, is, not, uh, is going to be retained and that is going to increase the blood volume which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. So this is a direct renal mechanism. In terms of an indirect mechanism, this is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. So a decreased arterial blood pressure causes the release of renin from the kidneys. So renin is this hormone that will enter the blood and is going to catalyze the conversion of angiotensinogen from the liver, it's produced from the liver, into angiotensin 1. And then the hormone, um, sorry, the enzyme, on angiotensin converting enzyme, especially from the lungs, is going to convert the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, once you have angiotensin 2, it's going to act in four ways to stabilize arterial blood pressure and the extracellular fluid. One, it stimulates the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal um, cortex of the adrenal gland. Second, it causes the release of ADH or antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary. And this is going to trigger the hypothalamic thirst center to drink more water. And this acts as a potent, it also acts as a potent vasoconstrictor, which directly increases the blood pressure. So let's examine the indirect renal mechanism in figure 1912. So let's say there's a drop in the arterial pressure. This is going to inhibit the baroreceptors and it's going to increase sympathetic nervous system activity which is going to increase renin release from the kidneys. So once renin is released, it's going to uh, cause angiotensinogen to be converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is going to be converted to angiotensin 2 by the ACE, uh, this enzyme. Now, angiotensin 2 is very potent. It's going to target 1, the adrenal cortex, to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to target the kidneys and it's going to cause the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. So when sodium is reabsorbed, water is going to follow. So water is going to be reabsorbed and that is going to increase the blood volume because if it's reabsorbed, that means we're not eliminating the water, right? We're reabsorbing it, it's going back into circulation and that is going to increase the blood volume, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. Angiotensin 2 is also going to target the posterior pituitary to release ADH or antidiuretic hormone. As the name suggests, antidiuretic hormone prevents, uh, uh, inhibits, not prevents, inhibits diuresis. So that means that the water is not eliminated in urine, so the water is reabsorbed by the kidneys and that is going to increase the blood volume, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. Angiotensin 2 is also going to target the thirst centers in the hypothalamus, which is going to cause us to become thirsty and increase our water intake, which is going to increase our blood volume, which is going to increase the mean arterial blood pressure. And angiotensin 2 also causes uh, the um, uh, causes vasoconstriction in the um, uh, peripheral vessels that is going to increase the total peripheral resistance, which is going to 
increase the mean arterial pressure. Summary of blood pressure regulation. So the goal of blood pressure regulation is to keep the blood pressure high enough to provide adequate tissue perfusion, but not so high that blood vessels are damaged. So for example, if the blood pressure to the brain is too low, perfusion is inadequate and the person loses consciousness. If the blood pressure to the brain is too high, a person could have a stroke. So figure 19.13, factors that increase mean arterial pressure. So this here is a summary. Um, so an increase in the activity of the muscular pump and respiratory pump is going to increase the venous return, which is going to increase the stroke volume, which is going to increase the cardiac output, and it's going to increase the mean arterial pressure. Um, a decrease in the release of atrial nitroretic peptide, which is produced in the walls of the heart, is going to increase the conservation of sodium and water by the kidneys, which is going to increase the blood volume, which is going to increase the venous return, which is going to increase the stroke volume, which is going to increase the cardiac output and the mean arterial pressure. Fluid loss from hemorrhage, excessive sweating, is going to decrease the blood volume and is going to um, decrease the blood pressure, which is going to cause uh, the uh, conservation of sodium and water by the kidneys. And we saw what, what happens if you follow that down. Uh, and this is going to target the bar baroreceptors, which is going to activate the vasomotor and cardioaccelatory acceleratory centers in the brainstem, which is going to increase the, diameter, uh, the heart rate and the, decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, which is going to increase the total peripheral resistance. And this is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. Crisis stressors, exercise, trauma, and an increased blood uh, temperature uh, due to uh, fever, for example, is going to decrease blood pH, decrease oxygen, increase CO2, which is going to uh, be sensed at the level of the chemorece chemoreceptors, which are going to target those, uh, activate the vasomotor and cardioacceleratory -accel centers in the brainstem, uh, which are going to, if you follow it down, in the end, the mean arterial pressure is going to increase. So if there's an increase in the vasomotor tone, blood-borne chemicals such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, ADH, and angiotensin II is going to decrease the diameter of blood vessels, which is going to increase the total peripheral resistance and increase the mean arterial pressure. Dehydration or a high hematocrit is going to increase the blood viscosity, which is going to increase the total peripheral resistance, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. An increase in body size is going to increase the blood vessel length, which increases the total peripheral resistance, which is going to increase the mean arterial pressure.